Scholar with Politics and Prose. We're live with Dr. Jen Gunter and Molly Jong Fast discussing the Menopause Manifesto, Own Your Health with Facts and Feminism. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To enable captions, click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of the screen. And we do wanna thank all of you out there for joining us. We are really grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce this incredible book. The internationally renowned New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of The Vagina Bible, Dr. Jen Gunter is the internet's OBGYN and one of the fiercest advocates for women's health. Now in the Menopause Manifesto, Dr. Jen Gunter brings you empowerment through knowledge by countering stubborn myths and misunderstandings about menopause with hard facts, real science, fascinating historical perspective, and expert advice. The only thing predictable about menopause is its unpredictability. Factor in widespread misinformation, a lack of research, and the culture of shame around women's bodies, and it's no wonder women are unsure what to expect during the menopause transition and beyond. Frank and funny, Dr. Jen debunks misogynistic attitudes and challenges the over-mystification of menopause to reveal everything you really need to know about. And Dr. Gunter will be in conversation with author and pundit Molly Jong Fast. She is a contributor at The Bulwark and also writes for The Daily Beast, Glamour, and The Independent. She is the host of The New Abnormal, a podcast about politics and the time of COVID. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jen Gunter and Molly Jong Fast. Thank you both. Thanks so much for having us. Very excited to get to interview Dr. Jen again. This is not our first rodeo together. I interviewed her at the Strand Bookstore. How many years ago was that? 50? I know, right? It was it was another era. <laughs> and 7,000 years ago. I know, like time. What does it even mean now? Like, I, I, you know, I, I seriously, I'm like, was that last week, last month, two years ago, a decade ago? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, so I'm going to ask you some questions that are probably not going to be as good as the listeners questions, which is why we need uh, our listeners to ask questions because Dr. Jen is here to answer your questions and she's very smart and she's a doctor and she's also my friend, um, but she lives in San Francisco so we can never see each other. Um, I, my, my first question for you is what is the number one biggest myth of menopause? So I think the biggest myth is this concept that that is a pre-death, that it's the end of relevance for women, that it is a sign of being decrepit and useless. And, you know, you should just, you know, go and sit in the corner and await your, you know, your passage, you know, across the river sticks kind of thing. And, you know, we have this wealth of data now that tells us that, that that's just not the case, that, that, our ancestral, our ancestors were incredibly productive throughout their menopause and helpful and useful. And so this idea that our relevance is somehow tied to our ovarian function, I think that's the biggest myth. What, when does, not that I'm anxious about this in any possible way, sorry, that was one of my children coming home. My kids are big door slammers. That's a, one of the hallmarks of teenagehood in my household. Um, well, I'm not worried about this at all, but if I were to be worried, what's the age range uh, for menopause? Yeah, like, so when should I start panicking? Well, you shouldn't panic. Um, you know, just like you didn't panic, you know, when puberty started. So I would say you know, the average age of menopause is about 51. But women can have symptoms for years beforehand. So, you know, seven, eight years sometimes, sometimes only three or four, it's very variable. And that's called the menopause transition, which we used to call pre-menopause or perimenopause. And during that time, you can have some of the symptoms of menopause can start. And in fact, they can sometimes even be worse for some women because it's kind of a time of hormonal chaos, uh, like puberty. Um, 
it will I be as crazy? Let's just talk about me. We're not even going to okay. no. talk about Molly. Yes. Yeah. Will I be as crazy uh, in menopause as I was in puberty? Well, I think that's a, you know, we always like to call, you know, women crazy, right? Like that's, right. But that's I mean, I feel like teenagers are not great decision makers. <laughs> I say this as someone with many of them, like, like, I don't know that I want a teenage brain surgeon. Right. No, I agree. Um, but you know, the teenage brain is also still developing. Right. So you have this right. difference. So you have the hormonal changes starting. Also, you have an immature brain. So it is true that some people can have um, some, uh, you know, some symptoms related to the, that menopause for some people can trigger depression right. and menopause can also cause for some people, especially the menopause transition brain fog, which yes. is kind of like feeling a feeling of forgetfulness, but that doesn't happen to everybody. And right. it's also not a sign of dementia. It's a temporary right. change, uh, kind of like while your new program is being uploaded, think about it that way. Um, one fact that might make you feel better is there's a study that compared uh, women in the menopause transition, their, you know, their, um, their memory and their recall with men. And even in the menopause transition, women outperformed men. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. And, and also not terribly surprised. Um, so talk to me about uh, how you see, uh, how you see menopause sort of, uh, where are you with like tr with hormone treatments? Are, do you, are you a believer in that? Is that what is, and also more than that, like what is the common medical perspective on that now? Right, so hormones, hormones, which we call menopausal hormone therapy, uh, help many women, but they're not essential. Not everybody needs them. And so, you know, whether hormones are going to be helpful for an individual person will depend on your symptoms and also the medical conditions that you're at risk for. So somebody at very high risk for osteoporosis, who's also really suffering with hot flushes, uh, may very well benefit and, and have more longevity taking um, estrogen. Someone who doesn't have that risk and isn't bothered by symptoms, you know, you don't need to take a medication if it's not going to do anything for you. And so this is really the art of individualized, you know, patient care that, you know, menopause is happening to somebody at the same time as they're aging. And so it's important to also remember that, you know, not everything that's happening is hormonal related and that, that for some people, you know, hormones can be helpful. And, um, and if they're needed, then they're generally very safe. Uh, you know, there, there's a very small increased risk of breast cancer associated with them, but they don't seem to be associated with a decrease in longevity, meaning that it's not shortening anyone's lifespan. And you have to counter that small increased risk of breast cancer also with the other benefits, for example, reduction in osteoporosis or reduction in, in diabetes. So, but hormones are just one possible treatment. What are some of the other treatments? Well, there are ones nobody wants to hear about. So the three healthiest things for your <laughs> menopause are to not smoke. Okay, that's good. Exercise. Got that one. Got that one. Exercise and to eat healthy. Oh, all right. Yeah. And so, you know, those are the three most important things in exercise, especially. So during the menopause transition, we actually have an accelerated loss of muscle mass. And this is what can actually lead to some weight gain around the middle of what's called visceral fat, which is inflammatory fat and, and more dangerous. And, uh, and so exercise is protective. It can blunt that effect. It can help you preserve your muscle mass. Can you explain why it's more dangerous? Oh yeah, so visceral fat is inflammatory. So it's associated with, um, with uh, having more of the bad cholesterol. It's associated with increased risk of heart disease and diabetes. It's metabolically active. It's producing things that aren't, that aren't helpful for your body in flat, from an inflammation standpoint. And so, uh, and, and you can't necessarily tell looking at someone if they have visceral fat. So you can have a body mass index in what's considered the, you know, the normal range and actually still have visceral fat. And you can be someone who has a body mass index of what would be considered, you know, obese and actually have very little visceral fat. So it's the visceral fat. That's actually sort of really the, the sort of the harmful fat. And, um, that's the one that, so during menopause, we, we start to increase putting on the visceral fat. And that's why a lot of women talk about, you know, suddenly feeling bigger around their middle. Um, and that, and that could be from that. So what can we do to fight the visceral fat? 
Well, exercise is highly preventative um, and also the healthy diet. So um, when you're taking in extra calories, when you're um, taking in, um, you know, extra, extra glucose, what's happening is if you if you're not using that, it gets stored as fat. And, and some of that can be stored as visceral fat. So, you know, those are the things. And then obviously there's a condition called metabolic syndrome, which is uh, associated with, with an increased waist circumference and elevated cholesterol and blood pressure and a few other things. And if you have metabolic syndrome, then there, you know, there may be specific treatments that your doctor recommends, like going on statins for high cholesterol and other things. Do you think I mean, I, as a hypochondriac myself and someone who loves to interview doctors because of my terrible hypochondriasis, I, there's a lot of um, illnesses that it says, you know, it's not a problem until you hit menopause for women, right? Like heart attacks. The, I mean, I know there's a rate of heart attacks in premenopausal women, but it goes way up after menopause, right? And different kinds of, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, so the, you know, the medical conditions that are associated with menopause are definitely heart disease. And so not just heart attack, like stroke and also peripheral vascular disease. And that increase actually starts, you know, during the menopause transition. Uh, it, for many, it's also associated that increase in visceral fat is also a risk factor. So uh, dementia, there's an increased risk of dementia with menopause, especially early menopause or earlier menopause and osteoporosis. Those are probably some of the three biggest ones. What, from a longevity standpoint. What earlier menopause is like what? So if you look at the average age of 51 for menopause, right. you know, so every year that you're under that, there is a, sl a very slightly increased risk of the problems. But once you're sort of below 45, that starts to increase even more. And if you're below 40, increases even greater. And that's yeah. primary ovarian insufficiency. So the younger you are overall, when you have menopause, the greater the risk of complications from it. And so, you know, that's why it's important to be aware of it, because if you go through menopause at 43 and you're completely done, you have a far different impact for you health-wise than someone who goes through menopause at 52. Wow. That's really scary. Well, I mean, Many medic, you know, so for example, you know, there's we're we're all at risk for different medical conditions, right. right? And I think that that knowing about it is actually the most, you know, then you can be empowered to make decisions that that can be beneficial for you. So, for example, say you're someone who goes through menopause at 43. Well, if you know that there's an increased risk, if you go on a menopausal hormone therapy, that will blunt that risk significantly for you. So, mm -hmm. you know, so there are things to do. Uh, if you're 24 and you think, Ooh, I, you know, I don't want to go through early menopause. If you quit smoking, that will be helpful for you. So, you know, so I think that there are things that you can do. Um, and another point that I always like to make, you know, like men age as well. Um, and you know, they, they develop medical conditions as they age. They just don't have that sort of that visible sort of trigger that, um, that increases things. So, you know, it, it, it's not like heart disease and all these things are uniquely happening to us. Um, do you, all right. I have, people have lots of questions, uh, ask you guys write in questions because we're going to do like another 10, 15 minutes of talking. And then we're going to, and then Jen, you don't want my answers. I mean, it would be kind of fun to have my answers, but my answers have no medical weight. So we're going to, we're going to go to Jen's answers for your questions. Uh, but first, um, I have a few more questions. So what do you think, um, what do you think the single sort of biggest uh, thing that you would tell patients is, like, how do you even know when you start having menopause? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And I think that that's a really speaks to this culture of silence and shame about menopause that so many people ask that exact same question. How do you even know? I mean, think about it. I mean, it's 2021, like everybody should know this, but they don't because, you know, an aging woman's body is shameful or, yeah. you know, it's just, we don't talk about it because like, there's nothing worse in the world than being a woman in menopause. Like that's sort of what it, it seems to be like. So menopause is, is, can be, the term can be used in a couple of different ways. So most people say use menopause or in menopause from your final menstrual period onwards. 
Although that's medically, we call that post-menopause. Medically, we say menopause is the final period and then everything after is post-menopause. And the time before is the menopause transition. But because the medical complications and the symptoms can start during the menopause transition, sort of distinguishing between sort of before and after your period isn't really necessary. If you're having really bad hot flushes and you're 48, but you're still having an occasional period, we wouldn't make you wait until your period stop before you get treatment. And so that's why I think it's, I personally think it's more important to think about it as a big continuum. And, you know, it's really just thinking about the symptoms that you have and the medical conditions you're trying to prevent. That's so interesting. I'm sorry, everyone is making lots of noise around me. As is always the way here, even though I'm constantly recording a podcast or doing something, but they're always, um, you know, I have seven, as you know, I have 17 year old twins and I swear they only come up and ask me questions when I'm recording something. I'm like, can you not see that I'm actually doing something? Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, and also like the men in this house never use headphones, just the women, the what men, are like, that? you're very lucky to get to hear my conversation. So both sides of my conversation. Okay, what is up with that? I'm always walking into my son's rooms going, you know, you could put some headphones on because I don't really like need to hear that. And, you know. I don't know. It's very weird. Um, so can you, are there other drugs besides hormones that people could take for menopause? And can you sort of explain what the landscape looks like there? Yeah, so that's also a really great question because one of the reasons why I wanted to write this is what a lot of people only talk about is hormones. And there's actually a wide range of therapies. And while, you know, hormone, um, hormones, menopausal hormone therapy is really quite safe for the majority of women under the age of 60, not everybody wants to take hormones or not everybody feels good taking them. And some people want other options and aren't more options good to have. I, I think they are. Uh, so, so yeah, so it depends on your symptoms. So certainly if you're only having vaginal symptoms, there are vaginal hormones, there's estrogens, as well as a hormone called DHEA. Um, and and uh, actually a drug you can take by mouth called ospamaphine that, that can also help with vaginal dryness. Then uh, for hot flashes, um, some antidepressants can be really helpful. For example, a venlafaxine, which is a fixer, I mean, very helpful for hot flushes. And the drug gabapentin, which we use for, it's, it used to be used a lot for epilepsy, although it's used much less for that now. We use it for chronic pain, we use it for depression. It's used sometimes for other mood disorders and it's actually really effective for hot flushes um, and also for sleep disturbances associated with menopause. And, uh, and cognitive behavioral therapy can help a lot of the symptoms of menopause. It can help with insomnia, it can help uh, with incontinence and it can help with hot flashes. It's really amazing um, and depression. So, you know, there are a wide variety of those things um, that are available. Now, a lot of people ask about like supplements and most of the over-the-counter supplements to treat symptoms are really ineffective or haven't been tested. And it's important for people to know that something that's untested, you shouldn't assume that it's safe. A lot of these products actually are adulterated. Some of them contain designer steroids or they may actually contain actual estrogen, but it's sold as like an herbal supplement and it's very buyer beware. So, yeah. um, so people should be very careful about those products. Do you, can you talk to me about sleep disturbances that disturbs me? Yeah, so sleep disturbances are quite common with menopause and they're also common with aging. So it's kind of like a double whammy. Uh, for a lot of women, it's related to having hot flushes at night. And, um, and so that, that can wake you up. Um, you know, I'm a super flasher, so I'm someone who is blessed with um, having, you know, more hot flashes than kind of average. And so even though I'm on hormones, I still have a fair bit at night. Although, I, interestingly, I'm a very sound sleeper, so they don't wake me up. Oh, wow. But I'm hot enough that it wakes up my partner. Oh. <laughs> I'm uh, like, can we not harness this for the energy crisis? Like, there must be some kind of mat I can sleep on that can collect, like, that energy difference because I'm serious. Like, it's really, like, when I get hot, it's like, oh, my God, where the energy um, that's coming off. Um, does hormone replacement work with hot flashes? Yeah, it's very effective. So estrogen is, um, is, the, is probably the most effective treatment, but you know, there are other treatments too. And people, 
people, you know, what they want to do or um, how they feel with taking hormones can vary. So other options, I mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy, believe it or not, it's really effective. Uh, and there's a couple of over-the-counter supplements that aren't so well tested, but there's some small studies that suggest they might be helpful. One's called s -Equal and the other's called Relizin. Um, and so, you know, those are some options. Um, black cohosh isn't effective. It's often promoted for hot flashes, but it's not effective. And one thing I would advise people with black cohosh is it's associated with liver toxicity. Uh, yeah. And 25% of samples that were tested in one study didn't contain any black cohosh at all. What is black cohosh? Um, it's a root um, of a plant and uh, it was used historically by Native Americans actually for, for um, issues during pregnancy. It was never used for menopause symptoms, but, um, but somehow people started to say that it was. And that's a real common thing you know, we see with supplements, this sort of appealing to sort of ancient cultures or other cultures and sort of exoticizing you know, what happens in other cultures. And, uh, and so you know, black cohosh is, a, I guess, a more of an a American folk remedy than anything else. And it's been shown to not be effective. Do you, uh, do you can you still get pregnant during menopause? So once your menopausal, no, once you're, once, once the last, once the last egg has happened, no, you can't. Um, but during the menopause transition, sure. Um, pregnancy rates are much lower, definitely. Um, but you know, it's a possibility. I, I have a friend who got pregnant at 47. And, uh, you know, she hadn't had a period for five months. So she just assumed she was menopausal, but you got to wait for a year. And to boot, you know, she had a long standing history of infertility. So why would she think she could be pregnant, right? Oh, wow. and, uh, yeah, she was pregnant 40, at uh, 47. And did she have the baby? Yes. She did. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, it, these are, it, so I always tell people with preventing pregnancy and the menopause transition, you know, it's a low probability, you know, the fertility rate for 47, 48 year olds is much, much lower, but it's high consequence, right? So, you know, and that's one of those things that how much risk I can bear might be different from how much risk you can bear or somebody else. And so, you know, people have to think about how that would affect their lives. Um, and also in the United States, people have to think about what state they live in because abortion may not be accessible to them. Yeah, I think that's looking really likely too. Um, so people need to write in questions. We have some questions, but we could use some more. And I'm going to start asking you in a minute, but I'm curious to know, what do you think, um, what do you think we can do to destigmatize the menopause? Well, one, I think we need to talk about it. You know, it shouldn't be one of these like, you know, whispered things that, you know, happens in hallways. Cause then that's the implications, it's shameful and it's not, right? I think that we need to hold the media accountable for how, you know, or the, the entertainment industry for how it portrays, you know, women as they age. You know, uh, if, you, if you don't look like JLo, there's something wrong with you. And the only person, you know, the only people who, you know, get attention, you know, that, those are sort of the standards we're held to. And, you know, men can be action stars when they're in 50s, 60s, right. and 70s. And, you know, what their partners are 25 year olds, right? The 35 year old is too old to play the wife of the 60 year old. So, you know, if that's the imagery that you see everywhere, of course, you're, you're going to think that you're, you know, you're entering into irrelevance, right? So, yeah. I want to see more movies like the fast and the furious with Helen Mirren, you know, um, you know, kicking ass and, yeah. you know, I, I want to see magazine covers with, you know, women who are allowed to age. I want to see, uh, you know, women who are, you know, who are newscasters who are allowed to have gray hair. Like, like we, we force women to hide signs of aging and, you know, women get diminished and men get distinguished. Like what's yeah. up with that? Yeah. Though J Lo is fifty one, right? So I do want to. That's pretty good. I mean, good. Yeah. For but you uh, know, looking like J Lo is also her job, right? No, no. I. <laughs> so should we go to questions? Should we? Do you have any other stuff you want that you? I'm curious to know what is your. Uh, what is the question that you feel like people don't ask you? 
Oh, right. people, you know, so the thing that I feel doesn't get talked about enough are the benefits of menopause, right? Oh, yeah. We're always way. talking about the negatives. And so first of all, you know, many people who've got heavy or painful periods or people who just like think periods are a drag, love not having periods. Like I, you know, I, I had such heavy periods that it was hard for me sometimes to pack just an overnight bag or, you know, a carry on on the airplane because like half my bag was filled with pads and tampons, right? So it's very liberating not to have that. Um, it's very liberating not to have any fears about pregnancy. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like I'm running at full speed. I'm 54, almost 55. And um, there's, there's no slowing down. I think that, that, you know, you, that menopause can have challenges for some people, but it's definitely not, not all negative. I tell people, you know, I met the love of my life when I was um, in menopause. So, um, you know, I wrote my first New York times bestseller when I was in menopause. So I love that. That is awesome. All right. I, should I start asking you some questions? Yeah, I've got the, I've got the chat thing up here too. Um, yeah. So our first question is any tips or resources with dealing with deceased, with deceased, with decreased sex drive? Well, that's a good Freudian stuff. So there's a whole chapter on that on the book. And so it's hard to sum that all up, you know, in a, in a soundbite, but yes, there are a lot of things that you can do and it depends. So some people have a drop in libido associated with, with their menopause transition, but for some people, it could also be because of other health things that are going on. So for example, depression or lack of sleep or vaginal dryness. So if those things aren't being treated, you know, lack of libido would be sort of an expected complication. And then the other thing to throw in the mix is if you've been partnered with someone for a long time, you know, have to have to remember that um, that uh, that that depression. I'm oh, sorry, somebody is knocking at my door and the dog is barking. And I hear I, oh, that sounds like a big dog. Yes, yeah, she is. She's a big lab. Um, and, uh, anyway, so the, um, what's I saying? So if you're with depression, decreased libido, um, so, so if you're with somebody for a long time, so if you're in a long-term relationship and you're partnered with someone for 20 or 30 years, you have to remember that desire is also going to wax and wane and come and go. And so some of that decrease in libido may also be situational, right? Um, it could be related to relationship issues or just the longevity of the relationship. You know, one of the big lies that again, we're sold by the movies is that, People are hot and horny for sex all the time, every single day. And, and obviously that, that's not true. The sex that happens in the movies is as realistic as the driving that happens in the Fast and the Furious. So, um, so I just think it's important for people to remember that it may be multifactorial. Uh, and one of the most effective things for improving libido is actually medical mindfulness. And the book that I recommend for everybody is Better Sex Through Mindfulness, written by Dr. Lori Brado, who is one of the world experts sort of on desire libido and that subject. Fantastic. All right. Hot, flash, hot flashes and chills. We kind of did that one, but any last hot flashes and chills? Yeah, so hot flashes can actually end up with chills. That is people, so once you've been super hot and so with a hot flash, you're not hot. You weren't actually hot to begin with, but your brain just thought you were. But it, it sort of triggered all the cooling mechanisms. So now afterwards, you can actually be cool and have the chills. And some people are actually more bothered by the chills that happen than by anything else. So, so it's important to acknowledge that chills can happen. So hot flashes have a whole variety of treatments. Cognitive behavioral therapy is very effective. Um, estrogen, as we talked about, can be effective. Um, medications like Effexor and Gabapentin can be effective. And actually there's some really cool new research on um, medications that work on part of the brain that is abnormally triggered um, causing hot flashes. So we might actually see really cool targeted non-hormonal therapies coming out soon. That is really cool. Um, all right. No. Okay. I press type answer. Are we in? Oh, oh, why is visceral fat so difficult to get rid of? I like that oh. question too. Because it is, it's, um, you know, it's not very doctorly. Come on. Oh, uh, because you, because it, you know, you can, so getting rid of it is, um, is, 
calorie, you know, calorie restriction and exercise, and it is persistent and it's tenacious. And it's one of those things that it's, it's takes, it's very hard to work on. So, um, but yeah, studies do tell us that, um, that people who embark on, you know, exercise and weight loss programs will also lose visceral fat. Um, it just always feels like it's the last fat to go. Can you, uh, do lipo for it? Honestly, I love this question. I was actually, I know this is really bad and this probably shines a window into my own mental health issues, but I was actually thinking about those. So no, because visceral fat is not the fat. You can't grab it. It's not like if you stand up and, and grab like a roll of fat on your belly, that's not visceral fat. It's is packed in, fat around in your heart. heart. It's well, it's, it, you, you can't get visceral fat around your heart, but the, the, the kind that's metabolically active is packed like around your bowel and around your liver. And oh. so no, there isn't liposuction for that. That's the worst thing I've ever heard. I'm like, I have to say, I will take away that tonight. I will go to sleep and have anxiety dreams about visceral fat chasing me around. Uh, what type of exercise is best for visceral fat? Liver crunches. No, <laughs> yeah, your liver is going to have a workout. No, yeah. that, no. Um, so, you know, that it's really just the exercise for your overall health. So what you're, and also building muscle mass, right? So when you have more muscle that's metabolically active, then that's what, you know, instead of depositing visceral fat, you're, or you're actually burning that stuff off. So, um, so working on muscles and barking on um, a strength training, training program, working with weights, resistance bands, those kinds of things are very helpful um this question i love this question i have to ask this question yes, i'm, I'm sorry I'm lumpy. i have no idea what's going on uh what is with the crazy hair changes hair disappearing hair texture hair growing where it shouldn't and disappearing elsewhere oh god this is not i'm uh, this is not exciting i'm not excited for this well, you know, people only ask questions when they have problems, right? So all the people who aren't having problems aren't asking questions. So I just want to reframe it for you that you're kind of, you. you know, you're getting a, a, a bias sample. Um, and that's all about my mental health. But that's one reason I wrote the book, right? Because as an OBGYN, I've had the wealth of experiences of talking to people across the spectrum of ex so. So I know that not everybody, you know, is suffering. Many people are, but but so I want to reassure you that. So yeah, so some people can definitely get thinning of their hair that that coincides with menopause. And um, as for the texture changes, I don't think I know too much about that. But some people do. But it's unfortunate because giving estrogen doesn't reverse that. So there are some sort of complex changes that we don't understand. Um, and so, but it's definitely associated with it. And I would advise anyone who's having, you know, any concerns about hair loss to see a dermatologist. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Um, uh, all right. How will my endometriosis ovarian cysts? Oh, this is a good question. In, in endometri endometriosis, ovarian cysts impact me later during menopause, I'm 24. So endometriosis, which is a condition where tissue very similar to the lining of the uterus is growing in the pelvic cavity, can cause, um, can cause for many women pelvic pain, a pain with periods, and even infertility. Now, the good news is, is with menopause, um, that tissue tends to recede and go away. A very, only a very small percentage of people with endometriosis are, um, have a recurrence after menopause. It's a very, very small percentage. So, um, so the good news is, is that those symptoms should go away. Wow. Ovarian cysts also should go away because you're not ovulating anymore. So, um, so the, the kind of cysts that people get with endometriosis or the kind of cysts people get um, just from how their ovaries function, those should go away with menopause. That's fantastic. So that's the benefits. And, you know, some people who have really bad menstrual migraines, they might find that that um, that improves um, during, uh, you know, during their um, their menopause as well, because they're not having those big fluctuations in hormones to trigger that. What foods will help most with the menopause symptoms? Uh, well, no foods will really help with symptoms. That's kind of a big myth that you can like balance your hormones with food or do something like that. So uh, the best thing food can do for you is, is keep you healthy. And um, so having a high fiber diet, eating lots of legumes is associated with, um, you know, with uh, benefit with uh, sort of 
beneficial, um, you know, uh, changes during menopause. Um, having a, you know, a, a, a primary plant-based diet is also very helpful, but you also want to make sure that you're getting a couple of servings of fatty fish. Okay, this was so good. We, All right, we lost Dr. John. Um, She's because coming back. Because that as gives you your omega-3 fatty acids. And we're vegan on our diet. All right, Dr. Jen got a little bit frozen here. I think oh, I froze. You're back, you're back. You're back. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Back. tips for parenting a 17 year old when we're both so moody. <laughs> well, yeah. Too, right. Um, you know, I think acknowledging the chaos is a good thing. I think acknowledging it, I think instead of people hiding, I think saying, you know, Hey, you and I are both moody right now. Let's talk about it. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know if I have great advice for that. I'm, I'm definitely not a relationship expert. <laughs> Well, it's a good, I mean, I think it is, uh, it's a, it's, you know, I think it's a really important question on how to deal with like what's going on. All right. Uh, what effect does menopause have on the skin? Right. So skin gets drier with age. Um, and, and menopause also seems to add to that. Um, cause menopause can have an effect on collagen production, the thing that sort of keeps your skin elastic. And so you have this sort of dual combination. And so a lot of people have dryness and so moisturize, 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 uh, don't use soap on your skin. Soap is drying. Use a cleanser. Um, cause those use, um, surfactants to pull the dirt off. So, you know, I'm a big fan of CeraVe, but you know, use Sarin and Cetaphil also make good cleansers. Um, so you want to use a cleanser. Uh, okay. It was good. Uh, let's see. Is there a difference between, hold on. Is there a difference between forms of estrogen patch vaginal cream in terms of benefits and risks? So, um, so I can just give you kind of a general answer because that, you know, that question took a couple of chapters in the book to answer. So um, the vaginal creams are to treat vaginal problems. So uh, you can treat pain with sex, dryness, and the vaginal creams stay local. So they're a local treatment for a local problem. They're not going to get in the bloodstream as long as they're dosed correctly. The patch or there's creams to go on your arm. Um, those types of estrogens are part of menopausal hormone therapy. And you know those have both the benefits and the small risks associated with it. Whereas you, you don't see those risks with the vaginal products. Um, so they shouldn't be viewed as they're, they're, they're sort of different, even though they're both estrogen ones just for vaginal dryness. The estrogen that you use in a patch um, may help your vagina, but it may not. Sometimes the dose isn't high enough. And so, you know, you have to, um, have to be careful with that. One thing I would say about, um, about uh, estrogen prescriptions is we do not recommend the compounded products that, um, that many doctors and naturopaths recommend. And the compounded hormones are actually now about 40% of the market. These are untested. They are, um, there are safety concerns with them. When you take an estrogen patch, for example, that's what I use. I know exactly how much is being absorbed in my bloodstream. This has been tested and I know the dose that I'm getting, I know the absorption rate, and I know the health implications from that amount of estrogen. When you use a compounded product, you don't have any of that information. So a pharmaceutical company takes them eight, 10 years to come up with that formulation and multiple studies and testing. The compounded product is just mixed up by a compounding pharmacist with none of that data. And so studies tell us that many of these compounded products either contain more hormone than they should, or they contain less, or they're not absorbed well into the body. And so, you know, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine really advises against them. And there's a lot of thought about the FDA saying that these are really high, high risk compounded medications that should really only be made in extreme circumstances, meaning when someone has a true allergy to an ingredient, but otherwise they are not not safer, they are riskier. Wait, can you explain what a compounded estrogen is? Sure. So instead of getting a prescription from a pharmaceutical company, like a patch that, that you buy that comes from, you know, 
uh, you know, I, I don't even know who makes them all, but it's all Park Davis or whoever. Right. Um, your doctor writes a prescription and a compounding pharmacist takes a little bit of this estrogen, a little bit of that, and mixes it up in a cream that you're going to put on your skin and mixes it up in a pill that you're going to take by mouth. And sometimes they add in other hormones like testosterone or DHEA, and none of that is recommended. And so you're getting these sort of, um, cocktails, private cocktails, um, things made especially for you, but in fact, they're not. Um, and often they're made based on data from hormone tests are also scams. Why do people, why do doctors prescribe this? This sounds insane. Okay. So it's, it's a huge industry. So you have people coming back to see you over and over again to get these unnecessary tests so you can monitor their therapy. It's a huge moneymaker. And then you're telling people that they can only, you know, some of these doctors charge $800 for a consultation, right? Um, um, and it's this, this huge idea that you're giving them something special just for them. And it's based in absolutely no data. And in fact, there's data to tell us that, um, that you know, we don't use hormone tests to guide therapy. That's how we treat people based on symptoms. Just you know, to blame that because that, you know, is expected to happen. All right. What? I feel like the long-term effects of menopause for me have been a permanent inability to modulate temperature like I used to. If it's hot outside, I can't handle it the same way. Once I get warm, it sparks higher and faster and harder to cool down. Is this a real effect? Is there anything I can do? It's been several years. Yeah, so I have that same thing. It's once I get hot, it's very hard to, to cool down. And it does feel, you know, I'm, you know, four or five years into it. And I'm also on estrogen. And it still happens now and then. It's worse when it's hot outside. So when there's a hot, it's very bothersome, but it, it can go in runs. Stress seems to make it worse. And so, yeah, it's definitely a phenomenon that we hear about. Uh, in our uh, medications like gabapentin may help, but you know it's not necessarily guarantee. And unfortunately, sometimes there are some of these um, sort of these permanent changes that you know that that hopefully will go away with time. But um, but I have to say, I don't think it's maybe quite as bad now as it was two or three years ago. You know, two or three years ago, I probably wouldn't have come to an event uh, wearing something long sleeve because I just be so worried that, um, that I, you know, if I couldn't, I might start to get hot and, and now actually I can. So, so maybe things do improve a little bit with time. I'm really stressed about menopause now, <laughs> but I know that's oh, no, not the point, but I'm, you know, let's, let's a little stressed. So, you know, you got, you got your pregnancy. You got pregnancy. It's true. Yeah. I mean, you know, and the, here's the reality. Having uterus and ovaries and estrogen and all of that wiring puts a physical disadvantage versus men, right. right? We have blood loss. We have pregnancy complications. We have an increased risk of autoimmune conditions because of all of this wiring. So we have this difference. And on top of it, we get to be paid less. And if we are somehow like, that's not contributing to society, you know? So we do have this whole sort of women have spent their lives sucking it up, you know, because we have this different biology. So, so I would want to acknowledge that, yeah, like it, 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 it can be hard, but, um, but I'm confident you will get through it just fine. Cause you are, uh, you know, a super, for a smart, strong person. <laughs> All right. So here, uh, how long can you use HRT? Is it so safe well into 160s? Uh, so the duration of hormone, so the duration of menopausal hormone therapy. So we don't recommend starting it over the age of 60. Um, there is definitely an increased risk of dementia and, and heart disease associated with it at that point. However, whether someone's starting it earlier and continuing into their 60s um, is safe is a different question. And so right now, um, you know, we don't have good data saying people should necessarily stop, um, but we're gathering more data. There is more long-term data looking at the role of estrogen long-term on dementia. 
Um, and so we should have, you know, I think more data on that soon. And so I think people should, again, understand why they're on the medication. What's it doing for them? So for many people, menopausal hormone therapy has started around that time of their hormonal chaos, where they maybe had depression triggered by menopause and things are up and down and up and down. And if you're 10 years out from that, you know, that chaos is gone. And now if you're somebody at high risk for osteoporosis, then the trade-off with the estrogen is, is very likely well worth it because the risks are very low. But if you're someone who doesn't have any of those risk factors and it was to treat the hormonal chaos, maybe you might wanna try lowering the dose or, or stopping it to see if you need it. I mean, those are really individual things to discuss with your own physician. Um, but, you know, there's more evolving data here. Is hormone replacement safe if I have BRCA2 gene mutation and have had, but have had my breast tissue and ovaries removed? Individual health questions like, like right. that per se. Um, so, uh, but in general, um, having the genetic mutation isn't um, a hormone therapy, but obviously uh, people need to approach that individually with their own provider. Right. Makes sense. Uh, let's get, so let me get some questions that aren't so, oh, micro dosing. Micro, there's a question about micro dosing and I assume micro dosing and menopause thoughts um, there are, I'm not exactly sure what someone would mean by microdosing in That's menopause, like, the, uh, like with hormones. No, microdosing with like LSD. Have you read about that at all? Yeah, that, I mean, that's not something that, <laughs> that's, know, that's that's not something something that I have any data say, on. I think you as, a, as a real medical doctor, you don't want to talk about people microdosing with M LSD too. Well, it's not my it's not my area of of of, uh, of study, so they, you'd have to talk with um you know with a psychiatrist. I think to know yeah. you know with the ins and outs of that and the benefits. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good I think that's probably a very smart uh, call. Um, there was a very good question here about uh, brain 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 fog. And what you can do, uh, is it real? And what can you do about it? Brain fog is real and it's temporary. And I think that's a really important thing for people to understand that it's not a sign that cognitive decline is around the corner. It's a temporary change and it's, it may feel worrying, but it's not worrisome, right? And so, and to get back to what I said that, you know, <laughs> women with brain fog still outperform the men. <laughs> so, the researchers who looked at it actually summarized it as a temporary slowdown in the ability to take in new information. Um, and if you think about menopause, it's a complete change in your hormones. And it's in many ways like uploading a new computer program um, into your brain. And you know, when a new program uploads, there's glitches, right? Um, and so think about brain fog like that. It's a, it's a temporary glitch. Um, and so, so yeah, so, uh, there isn't any treatment for it per se. Hormones do not improve brain fog. So you shouldn't be taking it for that reason. Um, it's, it's far more complex than that. What do you think about soy? What's your take reg regarding soy intake? Uh, and I've seen with other, you know, like with my stepmom not eating soy. I mean, does that, is that a real thing or is that? Uh... Yeah, no. So soy is, so the data that sort of linked soy with less, um, less symptoms than in menopause is older and it hasn't been reproduced in studies. So, you know, looking at, you know, women in Japan who ate a traditional, you know, traditional diet, um, and they also had less hot pots. There are many things that could be reasons. There could be environmental reasons. There could be, you know, a, a whole host of other reasons. So what we found is, is that, and it's also possible that you, maybe you have to have a high diet and soy your whole life. Your body has to be primed for it. Or 
there may even be a different microbiome. People who uh, live in countries where soy is more in their diet, they may have a different microbiome because some of the phytoestrogens in, 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 um, in plants have to be converted by your microbiome into substances that can be more easily uh, absorbed, right? So there's a lot of variables that can go on here. There have been studies looking at giving pretty high doses of soy, higher than you could get, like, you know, in a traditional diet, unless you were really working at it. And it hasn't really been linked with any improved outcomes. And I think it's important for people to remember that all these diets that are high in soy, these traditional diets, they're also really healthy diets. They're high in vegetable, high in fatty fish, right? So people are eating a very healthy diet. So it's, you know, obviously that's associated with, and if you look at the Mediterranean diet, which is completely different, it's in those phytoestrogens that are high in soy, in, you know, soy rich diets. And yet people still have incredibly healthy longevity, but what's the similarity between those two diets? Lots of vegetables and fatty fish. So otherwise kind of healthy, you know, the sort of the healthy staples. There is one soy supplement, I think I alluded to it earlier, called s which has been shown in some studies to maybe help a little bit with hot flushes. So, you know, that's one thing to try, but the data is not overwhelming. So, you know, what I usually say to people is if you like soy, great, it, it's a good food source. And if you want to eat it, have it. And if you don't, great, um, not everybody likes it. And there's lots of other healthy foods. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I am trying to find questions that are a little more broad and not as personal. Though I did like the question about why do men think they don't have to have headphones and that they can just have conversations so we can all hear them. It's quite annoying. Uh, is, um, I, uh, I like this one question because yes. I don't really know the, I, I don't, I've never heard it before, but my boobs grew. Is that normal? <laughs> yeah. What do you, have you ever heard that? Uh, 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 not really um, but, uh, but, you know, hormone fluctuations can do different things for different people. So that's certainly a possibility. Dr. Jen, do you see patients in San Francisco? Um, I do. Um, I do. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so my, my primary area of focus is, you know, for people who uh, are, yeah, are having um, vulvar and vaginal problems or they're having issues that, you know, haven't been able to be solved by their, you know, their regular doctors. So do you, that yeah. must be very uh, hard to answer what I was going to at the questions here to see if there's anything else. Um, oh, there's a good question about preventing bone loss. Um, yeah. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yes, yeah. Exercise. Um, so first of all, making sure that you're putting bone in your bone bank, you know, we're all building bone until we're in our late twenties. So physical exercise will help with that, making sure that you have adequate calcium in your diet and not smoking. And then exercise is again, the number one thing mentioned. And if you are not getting 1200 milligrams of calcium a day in your diet, then i um, taking a calcium supplement to make up that difference. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, what about, um, okay, bioidentical HRT as opposed to regular HRT? So bioidentical is a marketing term. It's not a medical term. And so, you know, the, whether something's the same as what your body makes doesn't make it safe. So for example, people get breast cancer because of the estrogen made by their own ovaries, right? Um, so people, people can be very ill if they're making too much thyroid from their own thyroid gland. So it, being the same as what your body makes does not make something safe at all. And it's a marketing term. So, uh, you know, estradiol, which is the estrogen made by the ovaries is the one that uh, we recommend um, most for menopausal hormone therapy. Uh, and we recommend transdermal estradiol. That is the safest form. When you take um, any estrogen by mouth, there is an increased risk of cardiac disease. It's small, but it's definitely there. And, um, and there's also, because it's increased risk of clots as well. So transdermal therapy doesn't have those increased risks. So that's the safest. Um, and so it's the safest because it's been tested and we know that it's not the safest because it's the same estrogen made by your ovaries. 
the people who claim that um, that you know that that bioidenticals are somehow better are also usually calling them plant based, and <laughs> they're not um, because all hormones that you take, with the exception of Premarin, are made in the same way in a lab um, from the same starting compound. So um, that starting compound is found in yams or soybeans, but to call that natural is really a stretch. The way they're made is a process. So, um, and here's another kicker, the uh, estradiol that you buy to use, whether it's from a compounding pharmacy or a pharmaceutical company can never truly be bioidentical because the estrogen made by your ovaries is made from different building blocks um, than the estrogen that's made by semi-synthesis in a lab. So making something from a soy starting point is not the same as making it from the cholesterol that you absorb in your body. And that's how you make, est you make estrogen from cholesterol in your body. The cholesterol that you get comes from a variety of sources, not a single source, but it doesn't matter. It matters what's studied um, and is safe and effective, but bioidentical is a marketing term. Did, why did they take Duvry off the market? Do you know about that? Uh, I'm sorry. Here. Which product? I don't, I don't hear the name. D U A V E E. D U A V E E. Um, it's a formula I, that didn't have the side effects of other HRTs. Okay, so then that's two in the woods. What's, um, how about. Oh, I didn't. I didn't just uh, came off the market. It's quite new. I don't think it's off the market. Um, yeah, so um, it's, it can be very helpful for some people and horse urine and, um, and another substance that protects your uterus from, uh, from, uh, from developing cancer. And if it's come off the market, that is incredibly new. It's out of stock. That's what they say on the website. Um, so, I would imagine that's, I mean, I don't know for sure, but um, I would imagine maybe supply chain interruptions and things right now, but it looks like it's out of stock, not off the market. Okay, that's good. Um, do you, I am gonna, why don't I ask you just sort of one, oh yes, there will be a transcript available after this, but the politics and prose people can tell you, but yes, they definitely do. Um, uh, one writer, one question is um, from a woman who already bought your book, so extra points for that, uh, wants to know if you have information about hysterectomies in the book. Yeah, I mean, the way we manage, so first of all, there's information about how having a hysterectomy can actually lower your age of menopause. So um, probably related to the inflammation after the surgery, there can be an impact on the ovaries. So if you have your uterus out, even without touching your ovaries, that might lower your age of menopause a little bit. It's just something to think about. Um, but apart from that, if you're just having your uterus out, there isn't any other sort of impact on your menopause. And if you decide to take menopausal hormone therapy, then you don't have to worry about taking the hormone progesterone to protect your uterus because you don't have a uterus. <laughs> there, there you go. I think we are out of time. But I know we could easily go on for just days longer with all of these questions. Um, we really would here at Politics and Prose like to thank both Dr. Jen Gunter and Molly Jong Fass and our audience out there for really engaging with this discussion. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this incredible programming and we couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. So hurry up and follow the link in the chat to get your copy of the Menopause Manifesto, Own Your Health with Facts and Feminism, or just visit politics-pros.com. And while you're there, you can check out our calendar to see what else we've got coming up um, at the end of this month and in June. We hope to see you there. And from our shelves to yours, we hope everyone out there is staying strong, staying safe, and of course, staying well-read. We will see you next time. Thank you again, Dr. Jen, Molly Jong-Thass. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.